Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Monday Night Metrics. I'm your co-host, Ray Reich, and I'm here with the SaaS CFO, Ben. Ben, welcome back to Monday Night Metrics. Welcome. Great to be here. And like I said, love this topic. In fact, I know we were talking about gross margin, one of your favorite topics. So we're going to kind of dig right into it. For our audience, we love to answer your questions as we go throughout this session. So put them in the chat, ask your questions. What we've found over the last first few sessions that Ben and I have done, it's the nuances of these B2B SaaS metrics, what's included, what's not excluded. Do you do cohort? Do you do not do cohort? Those type of questions that our audience has told us the most valuable. So the more questions, the better, right, Ben? Absolutely. Okay, well, let's jump into it and have you jump into what gross margin on a total basis is. All right, sounds good. Just gonna adjust my screen here. So yeah, gross margin. So, you know, this is so key with a SaaS PL and at a high level, getting COGS versus OPEX correct. You know, so gross margin, this is an operational efficiency metric that measures gross profit as a percentage of each dollar of revenue. So we're all pretty familiar, I'd say with the gross margin, gross profit metric, but it's the coding of the expenses, getting COGS versus OPEX right, so that we can understand the true financial profile of our business and we can do this many ways. But obviously the benefits of understanding gross margin is to understand one, our overall margin, and then how much margin each revenue stream is producing for our business. And gross margin is a proxy for cash generation capacity before operating expenses. And when I say OPEX, that's before development, you know, or R&D, sales, marketing, and G&A, G&A being HR, finance, accounting, legal, IT, et cetera. So one thing in this last bullet, investors consider gross margin the key factor in cash generation, which is true, right? We wanna optimize gross margin. So we have a lot of margin dropping to the bottom line, dropping through OPEX to get to EBITDA. And that also gets to concepts later that we, we may cover like the rule of 40, operating leverage. So gross margin, definitely a key concept when we get into other metrics such as operating leverage. And Ben, before we go into a few more details, I think that last point you made is so important because a lot of investors, both VC in earlier stage and private equity in later stage, they love this concept of gross margin because they can say, I can ratchet my sales and marketing and other OPEX expenses down and know how much cash I'm going to be generating. That's especially true in private equity companies that look at consolidations. And when they mm -hmm. consolidate, they say, I can eliminate duplicate sales marketing and GNA cost. And I know I'm going to be generating a lot of cash. So this is a cash generation metric for sure from the investor's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely in the PE world. Yeah, exactly. We're going to look at gross margin, rule of 40 and operating leverage. Yep. Hey ben, what do you need to calculate gross margin on a total basis? So not much here. Obviously we need revenue. So total revenue and also revenue by each revenue stream and then our cost of goods sold for our revenue streams. In this case, we're covering subscription and services, but for your business, it could be recurring revenue plus transaction or usage or consumption. But in this case, we're covering subscription and services, but it could be for each of the revenue streams in your business. And I calculate this on a gap basis, or if you're on IFR, same thing, calculating on a gap or IFRS basis. So fully, you know, full accrual accounting here. Ben, I've had a question a couple times from very early stage and some first times on B2B SaaS CEOs. Well, I thought SaaS was all about ARR. Why wouldn't I use ARR to calculate my gross margin? Because that, well, ARR, because one, we have to have the proper rev rec flowing through our PL if we invoice in terms longer than a month. You know, an ARR is just a component. Now, if our business is just subscription, you know, then that may be okay, but I'm still going to use revenue based because I can see trends in my revenue versus if I'm annualizing, you know, my MRR and I'm including new bookings in there and churn and different things, it can get a little messy. So I'm always looking at it on a P&L basis to understand that my, my performance, the trends and how I'm going to forecast that going forward. Great. And Lee, yes, um, this is being recorded and the recording will be available for all registrants as well as a copy of the slides that we're going through today. Okay, Ben, well, let's jump to the next slide here and talk a little bit about the formula. Yep, so pretty easy, right? Gross margin overall is just total revenue minus cost of goods sold divided by total revenue. And I don't think we have it in any of the other slides, but again, cost of goods sold, and I'm gonna talk about just pure play SaaS. There can be many forms, but cost of goods sold equals tech support 
customer success if they don't sell, if they don't have a quota, services, and then DevOps. And DevOps, I mean hosting third-party products embedded in your software to make it work. So that's what I consider pure play SaaS. Now, you may not have a service component, so that may be missing. But again, COGS, tech support, customer success, services, and DevOps. And I think we're going to talk about what if I capitalize any of my delivery infrastructure? Does that, can I get calculated into COGS, Ben? Yep. So that, that question comes up a lot. You know, and early on, early stage, we're probably not capitalizing our internal R&D development, so our product cost. You know, on a gap basis, when I was capitalizing R&D, I would amortize the cost, the economic cost of my product through COGS. You know, so if you look at, say, you know, public company SaaS p ls you know, that's probably going to be buried there, and that's how I've done it in the past in public companies. But for me, you know, I'm going to have my gap financials, but I also look at it on an EBITDA basis. So usually I'm stripping out depreciation and amortization as well. So I've kind of a fully gap P&L and an EBITDA P&L, right? Because everyone does it differently. Maybe you should be capitalizing R&D costs. You know, some companies are, some aren't. So EBITDA puts it more on a, a apples to apples basis. So when I calculate my gross margin, actually I'm backing out the, the amortization for the R&D. Interesting. So one of the things I love about gross margin is not only the cash generation impact, but it's a critical metric for uh, for so many other metrics that investors look at, such as customer lifetime value and CAC payback period. Ben, do you find a lot of companies forget to apply gross margin to some of these calculations like CAC payback period? Yeah, I think so. Because right, I'd say, you know, they're you know, as far as accepted standard formats and SAS metrics, everybody does it a little bit different. Uh, but, you know, I'd say gross margin adjusted is usually the most popular and accepted way to say calculate CAC payback period or customer lifetime value. So, yeah, that's why it's important to get our gross margin right, to understand our gross margin profile, because it impacts so many different metrics in our business. And Ben, do you want to go into any more detail on the P&L setup to make sure that, that it's set up correctly in the chart of accounts, et cetera? Yep. So again, software P&L setup, right? So I'm talking about, right, our revenue streams and then COGS. Again, what I mean by that, COGS versus OPEX, that we're coding things you know, correctly to our general ledger each month, that you know, in our COGS expense, we have, again, tech support, services, customer success if they don't sell, and then DevOps. So that coding between Cogs and OpEx, so key. So the correct SaaS software PL setup will build that foundation so you can easily calculate gross margins and metrics related to these. So Ben, we have a question here and it kind of goes right along with what you were just talking about and you touched on it earlier, but do companies with customer success teams that do both support and renewals try and apportion or allocate the department cost between Cogs and OpEx? Yeah, and that, that question comes up a lot in my coaching calls where I'm not a huge fan of allocations. You know, if, if we're talking about one or two heads to go through the effort in the closed process to allocate that each month, not a big fan. I'd put it, hey, where do they spend most of their time? You know, is that going to be in support or is that going to be in renewals? As you get bigger, if we're talking, say, you know, 10, 20, 30 heads and they're still doing both support and renewals, then yes, I would allocate that because that's going to be material enough. So you have to look at that to say, if I did allocate this, would this materially affect my gross margin? Again, not a big fan of allocations and unless it's a, a nice material correction to COGS versus OPEX. Yeah, it's interesting. I hear you're not a big fan. I actually, as company scale, when I say scale, it's kind of that 20 to 50 million. And mm -hmm. if expansion ARR becomes a critical part of their overall growth, one of the things I highly recommend is when you look at that customer success, if they're responsible for any expansion, kind of you know, upsells, cross sells, then you need to look at that allocation between not only COGS and OPEX, but when you're doing things like CAC ratio for expansion mm -hmm. ARR, you want to look at how much customer success cost should be allocated to upsells and cross sells. Do you see that too, Ben? Yeah, definitely. As you get bigger, right, you know, early on, you're doing many roles, but as you expand, right, you may create different departments where maybe in sales, they did both 
new biz and renewals. And then maybe you had customer success doing both. But I think as you get bigger, those uh, positions get more defined and more specialized that then, yeah, really important, especially in sales to track who's doing new business development, who's doing account management, because right, you've got your overall CAC and say cost of ARR CAC ratio, but then I want to understand the efficiency of my new business team and my account management team you know, who goes towards that. So then it gets more into, Hey, maybe I need a couple departments, you know, good coding on my GNL so I can track those metrics. And we have another question here, Ben, it's not about gross margin, but it's about CAC payback period that we covered a couple of weeks ago and we'll make sure Elaine happy to also send you a copy of that recording. But the question is, do companies usually factor both new ARR and expansion ARR into CAC payback period or just new ARR? Oh, that- that's a, that's a great uh, question. Usually, tr- traditionally, right, CAC, you think it's just new business acquisition, new logos, new customers, new users. Uh, but you can do both. I actually, in my course, I teach both, where I teach both, uh, you know, I do it on the cost of ARR basis. So what it costs us to get new customers and then also expansion in there as well. So just what I call my net ARR payback period, which includes ARR from both new customers and existing customers. So you can actually do both. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that, if you actually calculate CAC ratio, I think it's very important and most of my clients will do both the net new logo CAC ratio and expansion CAC ratio. Mm -hmm. The difference is it's not gross margin adjusted, but it's another metric that VCs love to see what they are for their investments. Okay, Ben, well, let's move on here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the benchmarks for gross margin. And I'm not sure why we didn't show the calculations here, Ben, we'll make sure we do that for subscriptions and services. But for benchmarks for gross margin total, you see the numbers here and you see they've been relatively stable since FY19. And on the left, you actually have the gross margin total. And on the right, you have the gross margin subscriptions. You will notice in FY20, we saw gross margin for subscriptions come down just a point. And one of the reasons was we saw new ARR take a real hit in Q2 and Q3 before we started seeing it Q4. So revenue growth didn't trend quite as quickly as some of the expenses. So we saw a small hit on the actual total gross margin. Yep, really interesting. Yeah, numbers because typically I'm shooting for around 80% gross margins overall, you know, an EBITDA based and then even higher for subscriptions. So interesting to see these, you know, when I profiled HubSpot's financials, you know, it's interesting as they got closer to IPO and then IPO year, all of a sudden hitting 80% recurrent, you know, gross margins. So it's interesting to see these trends. Yeah. And one of the things that drives it down is services too. And we're going to talk, yep. talk about services in just a minute. Yep. But if you look at the kind of span of gross margins on a total basis, and this, by the way, is from the FY20 benchmarks that Ben and I just recently completed. So 73% was right there at 50 percentile. And even at 75th percentile, Ben, for FY20, it was only at 77%. Mm -hmm. And then we had 68% at 25th percentile. So not quite as high, but we saw services being anywhere from 5 to 15% of revenue, and that can bring total gross margin down. So let's go into the gross margin just for subscriptions and make sure we go through the calculation overview here, Ben. Yep, definitely. So again, you know, same concept here, you know, whether we're talking subscription services transaction, but now we're just isolating this revenue stream to understand the margin that we're receiving from subscriptions. So this, you know, really all the calculations the same, but now we're isolating what we're measuring here. So it's just subscription revenue, less customer success, less tech support and DevOps. And that's how I come up with my recurring revenue or my subscription gross margin. You know, so as Ray mentioned, right, if we have multiple revenue streams and I've worked with companies who have three, four, five different revenue streams, really important setting up the set correct SAS PL, COGS versus OPTA, coding things to the right departments so you have the correct gross margin. And then it's super simple to calculate margins by revenue stream. So again, with it, obviously we're in SAS, so our subscription revenue margin is going to be one of the key focuses uh, on our SAS PL. 
So pretty easy, right, Ben? All you need is the gap revenue from your subscriptions, your software subscriptions only, and then the cost of goods sold specific. And could you just, once again, for the audience, on cost of goods sold for subscriptions, what's typically in there? Typically in there, again, is our tech support team. So inbound calls from our customers or messages. And then our customer success team, again, if they don't sell, if they sell, they're down in our sales and our CAC expense. And then DevOps. And again, DevOps meaning you know, Amazon or Microsoft hosting. Uh, I don't say Azure because I always pronounce that wrong. But, uh, and then, you know, third-party products embedded in our product to make it work. Say, for example, if you have messaging in your product and you use Twilio. So again, tech support, customer success, and DevOps equals COGS for our subscription uh, margin. Let me ask you a question. I got asked this question the other day and I'm not sure I answered it exactly as I was happy with. So let me ask you, should we ever consider capitalizing R&D or having R&D in cost of goods sold? Is there any specific reasons why you should do either, Ben? Well, you know, t- as you get bigger, technically under gap, right? You, or, you, you know, even IFRS that you're s- supposed to, you know, under that framework, capitalize the, you know, once you've reached technical feasibility with your product and you start tracking time to capitalize R&D, you know, but everyone does it a little bit differently. But as you get bigger, usually you're going to capitalize that R&D effort. And again, then for that, if I'm advertising my R&D expense, you know, for that product build, I'm going to code that to DevOps and they'll be in there. You know, so technically correct. But again, I like to look at my, my gross margins or subscription margins on an EBITDA basis. So I'm backing out depreciation and amortization because that it's easier to compare yourself against your portfolio companies or your sister companies or other business units. Yeah, we have a question and it is, do most companies separate out cost of goods sold for subscriptions versus support? Do they ever have a COGS for support? Well, you have a COGS cost center, right? So you have support, tech support, but, you know, unless you're charging separately for support or there's some other revenue stream, you know, then the support is just part of the COGS for subscriptions. Yeah. Now I will add to that, and I don't know if Elaine meant services or support, but professional services, whether you're charging for implementation support or training, et cetera, we recommend that you always carve out that revenue separate and a cost of goods sold for services mm-hmm. separate. Ben, do you concur with that at all stages of a company's yep. growth? Oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Because you have to understand those underlying revenue streams. Yep. Okay. And I think Kelsey has a question here. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. So what stage is it appropriate to clarify to capitalize some R&D? You know, so I've seen all sorts, you know, where it's like 3 million or 2 million and they've started capitalizing which I think is a little too early, not worth effort, you know, but usually say if you're above 10 million, you know, time to get serious about that. Or if you're going to go through a financial audit process, you know, it depends on how fast you're scaling and what are your goals with the company. You know, if, hey, you need a fundraise or you're going to exit or you're going to have, you know, have your first financial statement audit, you know, so it's always good to be ahead of that, the game, right? You know, instead of the auditors come in, it's like, hey, you better go in and capitalize R&D you know, it's better to get ahead of the curve. So it kind of depends on your financial profile, how fast you're growing, you know, and what's happening with your business, you know, where, you know, do you have some urgency in doing it? Or it's like, hey, you're slow growing, you know, it's, there's no urgency. We're not fundraising. We're not exiting. We don't need an audit. Then you, you have a little bit more time. Okay. Well, let's get into the actual formula, which is pretty easy for gross marginal subscriptions, but let's go ahead and cover it. Ben? Yep. So we hit on this before, but again, it's our subscription revenue, less, less COGS, which again, that's tech support, customer success, and DevOps uh, over our total subscription revenue. Now, you know, what I didn't do for tonight's Monday Night Metrics that we've always done before, Ben, is actually show a example, but let's just do one here. Just easy. Let's say you're a 10 million subscription revenue company. So if you had 10 million of revenue for subscriptions uh-huh. and your cost of goods sold was 2 million, you would take 2 yep. million minus 10 million minus 2 million, which is eight. And then you would divide that by 10. So you'd have an 80% gross margin. Correct, Ben? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, let's jump into the benchmarks for subscriptions in FY20. So the subscription gross margin that we found, and by the way, this was 748 companies that participated in this benchmarking research. The 75% was the median for subscription gross margin. 
And then we saw it go up to 82% at 75th percentile. And at 25th percentile, it was at 65%. So it seems like this is a little bit lower than what you've traditionally seen, huh, Ben? Yeah, and maybe because it's I've worked in businesses where we've had recurring margins close to 90%. You know, so it is doable to have margins, you know, that that high. But again, your recurring revenue margin, definitely your subscription revenue margin, most likely is going to be above your, your overall blended gross margin. And then we'll go into services. And I think this might be a little bit repetitive, but let's talk a little bit about why services gross margin is so important to calculate, Ben. Yep, definitely. And I'll answer Kamal's question real quick. You know, services, you know, if you train, if you implement, configure and train your customers, typically that is in your services cost center. Even if you don't charge for it, I track that separately. Now onboarding, you see that all over the place. That could be in your customer success team. That even could be tech support. That could be services. So that varies widely. But the implementation, the configuration, the training of your customers on your software typically would be in services. So you can isolate that and, and calculate a services margin as well. Yeah, Kamal has another question. So she wanted to confirm. So you recommend separating onboarding and training revenue away from the subscription revenue, Ben? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I would, I would consider that services revenue and, and not have that in my su- subscription revenue stream for sure. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what's interesting, and I get into this discussion many, many times. People are looking at their professional services cost or their customer service cost, and they want to recoup some of that. So they start charging more for services. So you get into a opportunity, and let's say it's a 50,000 ARR opportunity, but you want to charge $10,000 for services, and you're just trying to drive maybe 10 or 20% gross margin on services. The question is, what's better for a B2B SaaS company? If they can only pay 50K, should you do 40K of subscription and 10K of services, or should you take the 50K all as subscriptions? Ben, do you have a perspective as a CEO on that? Yeah, that always comes up with your services and sales teams of, you know, because yeah, you, I, for me, I do want to cover the cost of my implementation, my services team. I don't need huge gross margins on that, but at least want to cover that expense, you know? So that's why it's important to understand your services revenue and margins here. Uh, But of course, for us, you know, in the companies I've worked for is always pushing air higher, right? Because we have better valuations, the multiples better on recurring revenue versus services revenue. You know, so you could take a discount a little bit, you know, if it meant more ARR in that deal, you know, but it's a balance. I still want to cover my services because services, right, so important to make that customer successful. And if they don't value it and if they're not paying much, you know, it could create uh, an issue where they just don't see value in that, that services and that onboarding, you know, especially if you don't charge for it. Uh, so there, there's that balance, you know, but always, you know, we're trying to go as much error as we can while keeping, you know, at least respectable services margins. Yeah. And I think it's really important because I've had this discussion with a couple of service leaders who came from traditional enterprise or systems integration houses. And they're like, no, we should be driving at least 25 to 35% gross margin. And we simply sat down and we looked at math over a five-year period and said, if we get an additional $10,000 of ARR for five years, let's look at how much gross profit and operating profit that'll drive versus just getting the services year one. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's go real quick to the calculation. Yep. So again, you know, same concept here. And actually we can go to the next slide if you want, where we're isolating our services revenue minus our cost of goods sold for services. So on my SaaS P&L, actually, this is just one item. This is services on my P&L. So it's that services cost center. So it's really easy. So I take my services revenue minus my services cost center. I've got my gross par- profit, my gross margin. So that's why it's so important to have the correct chart of accounts, correct SaaS P&L setup, because then this margin calculation, you, you should be able to just simply look at your P&L and calculate it yourself or have it at the bottom of your P&L like I do. Uh, so again, services, you know, what I'm going to have in there, of course, is payroll, your wages, your taxes, benefits, travel, maybe you bill back travel, uh, training, et cetera. So fully burdened expenses going into that services cogs. Yeah. Believe it or not, Ben, it's a question I got about three weeks ago, and I'm going to share it with you and get your feedback on that. They're like, you know, we're, we seem to be spending more on customer support than we like. So we were considering splitting out a line item and charging about 5% of our annual subscription as support and services. 
and actually having a line item for support. What do you think of that for a SaaS company, Ben? You mean they wanted to charge like say a premium support or just allocate a portion of their subscription revenue to like a support revenue stream? They wanted to allocate it and show it to the client that of your 50,000 ARR, we're actually charging you $2,500 a year for support. Oh, to show it to the customer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of that because what happens is then they're like, well, what if I don't use support or I want a discount on support, right? You know, and that's the thing with SaaS, right? That's part of that, you know, service delivery is it includes the software upgrades, it includes tech support, you know, and that's just part of the price. So I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. Here's an interesting question about services and gross margin. So do they include the cost of PS professional services management and overhead into services gross margin calculations? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So all your leaders. So if you have a services director, services VP, uh, a tech support VP director, they should be coded to those cost centers. So they should not be sitting in GNA. You know, all your execs sitting in GNA. Like I should be sitting in GNA as a CFO and my CEO. But services, marketing, sales, all those leaders should should be coded to their respective cost centers. Yeah, in larger companies that I've been responsible for, I even look at the technology and automation I would use for my professional services team and tools. And I oh, absolutely put that into the, the cost of goods sold for services. No, oh, absolutely. Because we know we're selling software, right? So internal use software, so our CRM system, Zendesk, you know, whatever it is, those expenses grow over time, right? And yeah, those absolutely should be coded to those cost centers as well. Okay. Well, we got about three minutes left because we're yep. trying to make this fast moving, Ben. Okay. So I think what we'll do next is just look at the benchmarks for yep. services. Now, I would love to get your feedback on this because I think it maybe is the first time you've looked at it. But we actually found at median, they we were seeing 15% gross marginal services. And what was really interesting, we don't show it here, but we do show it at our SAS KPI benchmarks.com site was the larger the company, we typically saw a acceleration of gross margin on services. The smaller the company, it was much lower, often in that zero to 3% range. So any comments here about 15% gross margin on services? Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. I mean, I do like these, you know, for my services margins that I'm having 15 to 25% because you've got flexibility if you do need to discount. Uh, but it's interesting with the bigger companies. And I think I see that just as a customer as well, that, you know, rather than, you know, just a discount across the board, they say, hey, well, we've, if you don't, if this services price tag is too big, let's pare down the scope. And I'm a big fan of that. So it doesn't dilute your margins. They're just paring back the scope, you know, versus they saw our company, hey, we want that deal. We'll, we'll discount services, but we'll still perform that same scope. So really interesting. Hey, Ben, we have a question here for you. It's one I asked you when I first met you. Do you have a chart of accounts that you can share? Yeah, let me let me Google it real quick uh, and I'll paste the, the URL in there. Yeah, and that's, it's really hard because everyone has different sub-level of expenses they want to track, right? Like in marketing, do you want to track something even deeper than advertising? Do you want to track LinkedIn advertising versus mm -hmm. Google search, et cetera? So Ben... Do you have any recommendations on how deep, how many levels you should see in your chart of accounts? Yeah, and it's going to vary widely, but the two areas that I focus on that I help my clients with is typically in the wage area, you know, that we need good detail there, that it's like, like wages, taxes, bon benefits, bonuses aren't coded just to one account. I want to see wages, I want to see taxes and bonuses and commissions separate. And then in the marketing area, you know, by channel. So if you have paid ads, if you have user conferences, regional user groups, national conferences, you don't need many, but coding those major channels, those expenses related to marketing to those GLs, because then you can do additional analysis there. Okay. Well, we're coming up on our 30 minutes. So um, we'd love to answer any more questions that we have before we talk about our next topic. Ben, I think, do we have one more or not? A couple questions. Yeah. So, you know, should PS margin con Contribution not factor into CAC payback. No, yeah, no, I, when doing CAC payback, I do not uh, calculate services contribution into that because kind of I look at those as like separate business units. And another question with services revenue, I'm assuming you're looking at earned revenue based on milestones rather than the value of services billed. Yeah, so first services revenue, yeah, I'm looking at RevRec services. So either it's, it's milestone based or it's time and or it's percentage complete. 
Uh, but again, my services revenue is based on, on RevRec principles. You know, and that could get a lump, little lumpy over with, with services revenue, but then I'll measure it over a trailing, you know, say six, 12 month basis to smooth that out. Okay, I think it's all the questions we have been. I think so. Okay, well, we're right on that 30 minutes. And, you know, these first five sessions have been great because we built a lot of foundational elements for B2B SaaS metric calculations. And our next session on Monday, June 28th, we're going to be talking about customer lifetime value and the customer lifetime value to CAC ratio. And there's where concepts such as churn factor into that, customer acquisition cost factors into that, and gross margin factors into that. So I'm really looking forward to this session, Ben. Yep, absolutely. Sounds good. Okay, everyone. And within a couple of days, we will send you an email with a link to the recorded version of tonight's Monday Night Metrics along with the presentation. Thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. And Ben, as always, thank you so much for being my partner on Monday Night Metrics. Too bad, really enjoyed it. And everybody, please spread the word. We'd love to have more people on these sessions. So uh, enjoyed it. Thanks, Ray. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye now. All right, bye.